the three most infamous prostitutes in the Bible. A lot of people can be surprised how far the love of God goes. This will be a thorough line in these three characters. This message is for mature audiences, so do not be so quick to judge, so we all have fallen short. Remember to keep an open mind. Number one, why did God tell prophet Hosea to marry a prostitute? Hosea prophesied in the eighth century BC, and the books named after him are among the oldest in the Bible. In the biblical account, Hosea was commanded to marry a prostitute, which was considered as scandalous then as it is now. This was especially shocking as Hosea was intended to be a spokesperson for God. Hosea and the prostitute had three children, at least one of whom was not Hosea's biological child. To fully comprehend the story, it is necessary to understand the social conditions of that era. At the time, Israel was relatively prosperous and peaceful, although Assyria was the dominant power. However, Jonah's visit to Nineveh effectively postponed the Assyrian threat to Israel for a while. Because that generation of Assyrians had repented of their evil warmongering, the threat of an Assyrian invasion had passed for the time being. Israel experienced a period of prosperity, especially during the reign of King Jeroboam II, which stabilized the nation for a while. Its location on trade routes between Europe and Arabia was advantageous for the economy, enabling many merchants and bankers to become wealthy. However, despite the rise in living standards, society became more divided between the haves and have-nots. Many people enjoyed luxury goods in owning a second home. Usually a summer house in the hills was fashionable. The get-rich-quick boys became a new aristocracy. Nevertheless, housing became a problem as the rich became richer and the poor became poorer. While the wealthy had second homes, many ordinary people could not afford it. Morally, the consequences of the immense wealth during that time were quite evident. Financial frauds, bribery, corruption, and even the judiciary was affected. Justice wasn't served in the courts unless the judges were bribed. They started trading seven days a week because it allowed them to earn more money. Greed led to injustice, while wealth led to pessimism. Sexual promiscuity was rampant, and alcohol consumption soared. Despite the fact that this took place 2,700 years ago, similarities with modern Western culture are striking. Religious life was also thriving, but it wasn't Israel's religion. Instead, people developed a fascination for the faiths of other nations, particularly the Canaanite indigenous people's beliefs. This included the faiths of the East and West that traveling merchants brought along, as well as the Canaanite people's cult of Mother Nature. In the past, there were worshippers who engaged in sexual activities with male and female prostitutes in the temples of Bethel and Samaria. They believed that this would please God and result in a better harvest. They even went as far as to erect a golden calf in Bethel, which went against God's commandment against making graven images. This behavior was unacceptable for God's chosen people, who are supposed to be a holy nation in a royal priesthood. Despite their disobedience, God did not abandon the people of Israel. He remained faithful to the covenant he had made with them. However, he could not ignore their behavior and had to discipline them as described in the book of Hosea. When Moses gave the law, he warned that disobedience would lead to a curse and God had to take action. Even though he had the power to start over with a different people, he chose to remain committed to his promise and work towards the redemption of his people. The people were following fertility cults which led to their sexual promiscuity. As a result, God demonstrated that their actions had no positive effect on the harvest. Several harvests failed, and God was trying to tell them that they should rely on him, not on the fertility goddesses. However, the people did not listen and continued their pagan rituals, even though there was a food shortage. Following this, God sent a scarcity of fresh drinking water, which was a disaster in a land that relied on regular rain. Mildew and locust attacks destroyed the crops, resulting in food shortages for the animals. Despite being in a covenant with God, the people of Israel refused to turn to Him and ask what had gone wrong. Crops and livestock had already suffered. God now sent plagues upon the people, and enemy raids robbed them of their livestock. 
Each discipline was more severe than the previous one, as we can see. People were now directly affected. Nonetheless, they did not return to God. Storms caused fires. God also allowed lightning to strike some of their cities, destroying vast areas of housing. However, none of this had any effect. They didn't mind as long as they could keep their money and enjoy their vacation homes. On top of God's warnings, two more disasters occurred. It was as if God wanted to get their attention. A natural disaster. This was more than a minor earth tremor. As a result, Hosea was the last chance prophet sent to Israel, warning them of what God would be forced to do if they did not repent and return to Him. Hosea was tender. Hosea arrived with an impassioned plea to return to the Lord. Hosea spoke directly to their hearts. Hosea emphasized God's mercy. Hosea also expressed God's emotions. God took Hosea through an extraordinary experience in order for him to understand God's feelings. God frequently prepares a prophet through his relationships or lack thereof. God told Jeremiah not to marry because he would have to tell Judah that God, too, was now a bachelor. Jeremiah discovered how God felt without Israel through the loneliness of not having a wife. Ezekiel was told that his wife would die, but that he should not cry for her in order to show Judah that God, too, had suffered the loss of his wife. Similarly, Hosea learned how God felt by following some unusual instructions regarding his marriage situation. Hosea arrived on the scene ten years after Amos had preached in Bethel. He was to be God's final prophet to Israel's northern ten tribes. This time, instead of accusation, it's wooing rather than warning, tender rather than tough, mercy rather than justice. It is God's final request before the ten tribes vanish. A single word unlocks the entire prophecy. It is the Hebrew word, chaste. There's no direct English equivalent. It's essentially a covenant word, used to describe those with whom you've made a covenant. It does mean love, but it also contains a lot of the word loyalty. True love does not exist unless it is loyal. The entire relationship between God and Israel is a covenant love, and thus a chaste or stick-to-it love. Indeed, the book of Hosea portrays God's covenant love for His bride, Israel. God promised to watch over them, protect them, and provide for them. He had rescued them from Egypt and offered them the opportunity to become His people at Sinai, which they had accepted. He desired glad, eager obedience, a bride who desired to live the way He desired her to live. Israel was to joyfully respond to God's demands, knowing that they would be a delight to obey because they were given for their good. David's Psalms express his delight in God's law, the longest psalm in the Bible. 119 is entirely about the law's benefits. However, the people of God as a whole did not obey. By the time of Hosea, their failure was most pronounced. What happened to our marriage? God had to ask through Hosea's messages. He assured them of his steadfast love, but he was certain that he was receiving very little in return. Then his wife went back to her old job. Hosea found her, brought her home disciplined her even though he didn't know her as a wife. He then courted her and began his life with her as his wife all over again. The children's names convey their own message. The first was a boy named Jezreel, which translates as God sows it. He was a defiant, unruly child who needed to be disciplined. Lo Rahama, which means not pitied, was the second child. This was a neglected child who had never known love from her mother. Lo Ami, which means not my people, was the third child. He was the child Hosea did not father, so he was disowned. So far we've been disciplined, deprived, and disowned. The children summarize how God dealt with his people, the Israelites. The names of the children were significant to the message, despite the fact that I've never met any Christian parents who used any of those three names. The marriage of the prophet Hosea serves as a backdrop for God to demonstrate His incredible love for His people. God loves us unconditionally. Hosea lived a sad life, with gloomy days and sleepless nights, because his wife Gomer had been unfaithful to him, and she intended to return to her previous way of life. Hosea spoke to his children, pleading with them to intervene with their mother. 
He was suggesting that she had already broken her marriage vows. Their relationship had become unreal. Talk to your mother, kids. See if you can convince her otherwise. Hosea chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. Hosea, say to your brothers, Ah, me, you are my people. And to your sisters, Rahama, you have been pitied and have obtained mercy. Contend with your mother, nation, contend. For she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. And have her remove her marks of prostitution from her face, and her adultery from between her breasts. When people decide to abandon the Lord, life isn't as easy as they think it will be. Many people believe that straying from the Lord isn't a big deal. However, as we read the story of what happened to Gomer after she left Hosea's home, we will see that life would be far more difficult for her than she could have imagined. Talk to your mother, children, Hosea urged. See if you can convince her to stay with me and devote herself to me. Hosea chapter 2, verse 5, For their mother has played the prostitute. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will pursue my lovers, who give me my food and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my refreshing drinks. We should remember Gomer's heartbreaking exit. She said, I will go after my lovers, who give me my food and my water, my wool and my linen, my olive oil and my drink. She had no idea where her benefits came from. Most people who reject the Lord do so because they want some of their most basic needs and desires met, and they believe they can find that pleasure in the world. The devil is astute. He will persuade people that they will find happiness if they live for him and go out into the world. The unfortunate reality is that if you abandon the Lord, you will be unhappy. There is no genuine happiness in the world. Hosea chapter 2, verse 6. Therefore, behold, I, the Lord God, will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build the wall against her, shutting off her way, so that she cannot find her paths. Gomer's problem started, and she returned to her sinful life. Everything appeared to be going swimmingly. However, as we will see, she was pointed downward. Every step of the way, Hosea fought Gomer. At every turn, God fights for his straying children. Hosea chapter 2, verse 7. She will passionately pursue her lovers, but she will not overtake them. And she will seek them, but will not find them. Then she will say, Let me go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me than, than now. Gomer realized that she was unable to find what she was looking for, and her life kept getting worse. She made the decision to return to her first husband and said, I'll return to Hosea. I was happier when I was with him. Hosea chapter 2 verse 8, For she, Israel, has not noticed nor understood nor realized that it was I, the Lord God, who gave her the grain and the new wine and the oil, and lavished on her silver and gold which they used for Baal and made into his image. Take note of the following phrase. She had no idea I had given her grain, new wine, and oil. She assumed that everything came from her lovers. Her blessings, however, were indeed from God, as channeled through Hosea. Keep in mind that the Lord is the source of all good in your life. Hosea chapter 2, verses 9 through 13. Therefore, I will return and take back my grain at harvest time, and my new wine in its season. I will take away my wool and my flax, given to cover her nakedness. And now I will uncover her lewdness and shame in the sight of her lovers, and no one will rescue her from my hand. I will also put an end to all her rejoicing, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her festivals. I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, of which she has said, These are my wages which my lovers have given me and I will make them a forest, and the animals of the open country will devour them. And I will punish her for the feast days of the Baals, when she used to offer sacrifices and burn incense to them, and adorn herself with her earrings and nose rings and her jewelry, and follow her lovers so that she forgot me, says the Lord. We see God, who had given everything to Gomer, take it all away. The necessities had crumbled. The festivities were over. There was regret. That is what happens when a child of God betrays him and commits adultery against him. Have you examined your relationship with God lately? The Christian life is primarily a love relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. When was the last time you told the Lord, 
My Jesus, I love you, and I renounce all of my sin for you. Is your relationship with Jesus going well? Is there anything that hinders you from having a close relationship with Jesus? Nothing should stand between you and your Savior. It's worth noting that God's final words in Hosea are a heartfelt emotional plea, hoping that Israel will repent and allow him to delay the judgment that he must carry out. Israel was expected to respond with joy to God's demands, knowing that they were given for their own good. David expressed his delight in God's law in his Psalms. The longest Psalm in the Bible, Psalm 119, is all about the benefits of the law. However, the people of God as a whole did not obey, and their failure was most evident by the time of Hosea. What became of our marriage? God had to inquire via Hosea's messages. He promised his love to them, but he knew he wasn't receiving much love back. God instructed Hosea to marry a prostitute, and they had three children, one of whom was not Hosea's biological child. Eventually, his wife returned to her old profession. Hosea found her and brought her home. Although he didn't know her as his wife anymore, he still disciplined her. After disciplining her, he began courting her again. However, God explained that this would not be the case for everyone. Only the sinners in Israel would perish, and there would be a remnant who would survive. God promised to rebuild David's tabernacle and bring in Gentiles to be a part of his people. These prophecies were quoted 800 years later in Acts 15, when the Council of Jerusalem met to discuss admitting Gentiles to the church. The leader of the Jerusalem church reminded the council of Amos' prophecy, in which God promised to restore the tabernacle of David and bring in Gentiles. It's worth acknowledging that Hosea was unsuccessful in reconciling Israel to God. Despite their messages, the people ignored them, and God had to judge them as He promised. Assyria defeated and exiled them in 721 BC, and they never returned. Additionally, it's important to recognize that our situation differs significantly from that to which Amos and Hosea spoke. Israel had a theocratic government where the church and state were the same entity. In the New Testament, there is a clear distinction between church and state. This is evident from Jesus' statement, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. As a result, Christians today live in two kingdoms. While you may be a British citizen according to your passport, you are also a citizen of God's kingdom. Therefore, it is important to exercise caution when applying Old Testament prophecies to our current situation. Although we can apply them, we must keep in mind that the two situations are not directly comparable. For instance, we cannot take Hosea's message and apply it to the nation in the same way that God expected Israel to obey. However, if the prophecy is directed to people outside of Israel, a valid application can be made. God's accusations against the other nations were based on conscience, not on God's law. Likewise, a secular nation will be judged on whether it lived according to what it intuitively knew to be right. Therefore, some of the sins condemned by Hosea in non-Israelite nations do apply. This includes inhumanity, disregard for human rights, and legislation that enriches the rich while making the poor poorer. These are valid areas of application. This is not to say that the rest of the prophecies to Israel are meaningless. They do convey an important message to the church today, for the church, all too often, behaves similarly to the people of Israel. There are numerous New Testament passages that reinforce Hosea and Amos' messages. We, too, must return to God or face His judgment. So, when we read these prophecies, we must first apply them to God's people, and only then can we tell society what God says about the way they are living. Number 2. Rahab The book of Joshua introduces us to one of the most astonishing heroines of the Old Testament, Rahab. She was a prostitute in the Canaanite city of Jericho, but her great faith and place in the lineage of Jesus Christ make her noteworthy. By examining the life of this remarkable Gentile woman, we can gain deeper insights into God's plan for His church and His dealing with individual believers in grace and mercy. The story of Rahab can be found in Joshua 2-6. through This passage narrates the Israelites' conquest of Jericho, the most important Canaanite fortress city in the Jordan Valley, which was directly in the path of the advancing Israelites after they had crossed the Jordan River. Joshua, before entering the land west of the Jordan, sent two spies to look over the land. 
The king of Jericho got wind of the two Israelite spies and ordered them to be brought out to him. However, Rahab, the woman who was hosting the spies, protected them by hiding them on her roof. Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men as scouts secretly from Shittim, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho, the walled city. So they went and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and lodged there. Now the king of Jericho was told, Behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to spy and search out the land. So the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you. You entered your house, because they have come as spies to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. So she said, Yes, two men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. When it was time to close the city gate at dark, the men left. I do not know where they went. Pursue them quickly, for if you do, you will overtake them. But in fact, she had brought the scouts up to the roof and had hidden them under the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof to dry. So the king's men pursued them on the road to the Jordan as far as the fords east of Jericho. As soon as the pursuers had gone out after them, the gate of the city was shut. Now before the two men lay down to sleep, Rahab came up to them on the roof, and she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the terror and dread of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted in despair because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan on the east, to Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted in despair, and a fighting spirit no longer remained in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. And now, please swear an oath to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's household, family, and give me a pledge of truth and faithfulness, and spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters, along with everyone who belongs to them, and let us all live. So the men said to her, our lives for yours, if you do not tell anyone about this business of ours. Then when the Lord gives us the land, we will show you kindness and faithfulness and keep our agreement with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she was living on the wall. And she said to them, Go west to the hill country, so that the pursuers who have headed east will not encounter you. Hide yourselves there for three days until the pursuers return. Then afterward you can go your way. The men said to her, We shall be blameless and free from this oath which you have made us swear, unless, when we come into the land, you tie this cord of scarlet thread in the window through which you let us down, and bring into the house your father and your mother and your brothers and all your father's household, so that they will be safe. But if anyone goes out the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, that is, his own responsibility, and we shall be blameless and free from our oath. However, if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell anyone this business of ours, we shall be blameless and free from the oath which you made us swear, she said. According to your words, so be it. Then Rahab sent them off, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. They left and went on their way to the hill country, west of Jericho, and stayed there hidden in the caves, three days until the pursuers returned. The pursuers had searched all along the road but had not found them. Then the two men turned back and came down from the hill country and crossed over the Jordan and came to Joshua the son of Nun at Shittim, told them everything that had happened to them. Joshua chapter 2 verses 1 through 23. After safely escaping the city, the two spies returned to Joshua and reported that the whole land was melting with fear. Following this, the Israelites crossed the Jordan into Canaan, where they laid siege to the city of Jericho. Consequently, the city was completely destroyed, and every man, woman, and child in it were killed. However, Rahab and her family were the only ones spared. Eventually, Rahab married Salmon, who was an Israelite from the tribe of Judah. Their son was Boaz, who later became the husband of Ruth. Joseph, who was the legal father of Jesus, is Rahab's direct descendant. Rahab, a youthful Canaanite prostitute, was an improbable choice to become a heroine of faith. Jericho, 
or place of residence, was a prominent center of idol worship, particularly devoted to Ashtaroth, the moon goddess. The city represented everything that was repugnant and degrading in the Canaanite religion. Some Bible commentators have tried to remove the stigma of the label harlot from Rahab, who is included in the genealogy of Christ, Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. They suggest that she was a hostess or tavern keeper. However, the Hebrew word zana, which is used in the scriptures, Leviticus chapter 21, verses 7 through 14, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 18, Judges chapter 11, verse 1, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 16, and the testimony of the apostles, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31, James chapter 2, verse 25, support the use of the term harlot. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31, by faith, Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed along with those who were disobedient because she had welcomed the spies sent by the sons of Israel in peace. James chapter 2, verse 25. In the same way, was Rahab the prostitute not justified by works too when she received the Hebrew spies as guests and protected them and sent them away to escape by a different route? Rahab was a perceptive, intelligent, and well-informed woman. She was able to identify the spies who had come, hid them, and had a believable story ready to deceive the king's agents. She did not deny that she had entertained the men, but explained that they left at dusk when it would be difficult for anyone to clearly see anything. The agents did not risk searching Rahab's house because they feared the spies might escape. Rahab then gave the two Israelites excellent advice, suggesting that they hide in the hills for three days before attempting to cross the Jordan. Rahab was not in an ideal spiritual circumstance to come to faith in the one true God, the God of Israel. She was a citizen of a wicked city that was under God's condemnation. Rahab was a part of a corrupt, depraved, pagan culture and had not benefited from the godly leadership of Moses or Joshua. Rahab had one advantage. She had heard from the many men she came into contact with that the Israelites were a force to be reckoned with. She heard the stories of their escape from Egypt the crossing of the Red Sea, the wandering in the wilderness, and their recent victory over the Amorites. She had learned enough to reach the right conclusion that would save her life and that of her family. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Joshua chapter 2 verse 11 was the change of heart and faith that saved her and her family, which was coupled with actions prompted by faith. It is often said that Rahab was not only a real historical figure, but also a symbolic representation or type of the church and Gentile believers. She was, in fact, the first recorded Gentile to convert. There are many ways in which Rahab represents the church. First, she was a part of a pagan world system and worked as a prostitute. But by her conversion, she was able to become a legitimate bride. Because Rahab welcomed the spies, she was saved by her faith in God in heaven and on earth. Joshua chapter 2, verse 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. By faith, Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed along with those who were disobedient, because she had welcomed the spies sent by the sons of Israel in peace. Christians are saved by placing faith in Jesus Christ. For it is by faith you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Third, although Rahab and Christians are saved by an act of grace through faith, true faith requires and is exemplified by action. James chapter 2. Rahab was required to hang a scarlet cord over her window to be spared from harm. As Christians, it is important to not only accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, but also to live our lives in a way that demonstrates our faith. Although Rahab could have indicated the location of her home in numerous ways, the only way for her to be saved was to follow the instructions given to her by the Israelite spies. While the world may advocate for various paths to God and salvation, the Bible teaches that salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, referring to Jesus Christ. Rahab's faith empowered her to turn away from her society, her people, and her religion and turn to the Lord. True faith in God often requires prioritizing values that are different from those of the world, as we are urged to do in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Once we come to Christ, our past no longer matter. All those who believe and accept Jesus as the sacrifice on the cross for our behalf will have a clean slate. 
Rahab, who was once viewed as an unclean prostitute, was now considered worthy by grace to be part of the lineage of our Lord Jesus Christ. As she was grafted into the line of Christ, we also become children of God and partakers in His inheritance. Her story is an inspiring example for all sinners who have been saved by grace, teaching us about the amazing grace of God that can save even the worst of sinners and bring them into an abundant life in Christ Jesus. Number three, prostitute of Revelation. Who did the Bible refer to as the great prostitute of Babylon? John received the revelation of Jesus Christ from God in order to reveal what must soon happen to his servants. God revealed this message to John. An angel invites John to witness the judgment of this Babylon. And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of sexual immorality, and those who live on the earth became drunk with the wine of her sexual immorality. Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 2. We read, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute. From the very beginning, there was no question about her judgment. The fate of Babylon was clear, and it was destined to fail. Babylon was established as a religious system long before the advent of Christianity. However, in a satanic imitation of the genuine Messiah, it anticipated his arrival. According to religious history and legend, Semiramis, the wife of Nimrod, a great-grandson of Noah, founded the Babylonian religion. She was a high priestess of idol worship. A harlot is a class of people that has existed since early societies. This is evident from the story of Rahab. Babylonian religion had a strong influence over both common people and rulers. The city of Babylon is mentioned 287 times in the Hebrew Bible, making it the second most mentioned city after Jerusalem. Babylon was situated on the banks of the Euphrates River. According to the Bible, it was the seat of civilization that expressed organized hostility to God. Later on, Babylon became the capital of an empire that conquered Judah. During that time, the people of Judah were under Babylon's control. To the people of God, Babylon represented all that was evil. It embodied cruelty, lust, and greed. It was the enemy of the people of God. The concept of Babylon has been present since ancient times, even before the descriptions given in the biblical books of Revelation 17 and 18, as well as before the rise of the Antichrist. Babylon has always existed as a symbol of the worldly system that stands in opposition to God's ways. It has been exemplified by various empires and nations throughout history, including Rome during the time of John. However, during the reign of the Antichrist, Babylon will take on an unprecedented level of influence over the world, both in its religious and commercial forms. The religious Babylon is described. Revelation chapter 17, verses 3 through 6. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold, precious stones and pearls, holding in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. This beast, which has been depicted in Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, as having seven heads and ten horns, is symbolic of the Antichrist and the rule that he will establish. The harlot rides the same beast that is mentioned in that verse. The woman was arrayed. The woman was adorned with symbols of power and wealth, wearing clothing colored in purple and scarlet. These hues were considered luxurious and extravagant, and they were made from costly dyes. However, despite her lavish appearance, she was involved in idolatry, committing abominable acts, as well as impurity by engaging in adultery. All of this took place within the lavish setting of her opulent surroundings. The name on her forehead identifies her in more ways than one, it was common practice for Roman prostitutes to wear a headband that had their name etched on it. We read, Mystery, Babylon the Great. The title doesn't refer to the physical city of Babylon, but rather to the spiritual or secret representation of Babylon. 
This spiritual Babylon is believed to be the origin of all spiritual adultery and idolatry. The harlot mentioned here is not limited to a single department of a religious organization. She represents Satan's own movement, which could be described as the religion of the global order. Our world is susceptible to being seduced by the harlot because it is built on the idea that it doesn't matter what you believe in, as long as you believe in something. Rome was the ready personification of Babylon. Idolatry is just as prevalent as it was in the past, but it is now more widespread. But Babylon is doomed. She and they will fall. Their days will be numbered. The incredible manner in which this is accomplished is absolutely plausible in today's environment. Ambitious politicians, hungry for power, resent this financial clout. They are even prepared to bring about economic disaster if that will enable them to take over. The kings will be jealous of the woman who rides them and will resolve to destroy her. The city will be engulfed in flames. It will be the world's worst economic disaster in history. Many, many people will weep and mourn over the ruins. The disaster will have been brought about by God, not by any physical action. He will have instilled in their hearts the desire to fulfill his mission. He'll have persuaded them to join forces with the beast to fight the city. The Antichrist will have political authority and the false prophet religious control. The kings will now offer them economic control in return for delegated powers for themselves. But their possession of such privileges will be extremely short, one hour. Babylon's demise is so certain that it is depicted in Revelation as having already occurred. This is something Christians can be assured of. However, there are practical reasons for informing them. What is the connection between God's people and this final Babylon? There are three rules to follow. First, there will be many martyrs in the city. The whore is drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. This last phrase again indicates the presence of Christians and occurs throughout Revelation. In a city devoted to immorality, pious people have no place. Conscience is something that the community does not desire. Second, Christians are instructed to come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Babylon's story teaches us that being too proud can get us into trouble, and it's important to be humble. It teaches us that however mighty or ambitious we may be, our plans must align with God's will. When they don't, the results can be undesirable. So the next time you find yourself striving to build a tower, take a moment to consider whether your ambitions align with God's plan for you. Remember, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Psalm 127 verse 1. Prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah foretold Babylon's fall due to its injustices, idolatry, and immorality. Therefore, as individuals or as a society, our actions have consequences. Oppressing others, disregarding morality, and turning away from what's right can lead to downfall. We also see that earthly kingdoms are temporary. Despite its might and grandeur, Babylon eventually fell to the Medo-Persian Empire, just as it was foretold. In other words, everything on earth is temporary, from our own successes to the way society is built. The only thing that will last forever is God's kingdom. So, focus on what will last forever, not just on what is here today and gone tomorrow. The story of Babylon getting powerful and then falling apart shows us that God tries to communicate with us in many ways, and we should pay attention and not be too proud. Babylon was an amazing place made by people, but it fell apart because God wanted it to. This story is always important because it reminds us that real power and greatness belong to God. Like it says in the Bible, God's rule is forever, and it will always be there for all generations. Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. If you enjoyed this, there are other great Bible stories that we can learn about. Click here to watch more Bible stories.